Okay, so does everybody think that at least seems fair that Dr. Beck really has to, she has standards that she has to maintain also. So uh, someday you might have a boss, boss really likes you, just that after a month, you didn't know what the job was. <laughs> And so, you know, the boss is going to have to fire you, you know, because you aren't doing the job. They might really like you. <laughs> but anyway, so for those who are listening to the recording, I do want to meet with everyone who's behind. And they need to give me a plan, how they plan ahead, you know, very specific plan of how they plan to catch up. Uh, they can tell me what hours they, they work and then the hours that they will actually be doing the homework. Sometimes you don't know. Um, so that's, that's just the main thing. And I will start grading down on having it late. I will already grade down some because it's two thirds of the way through the class. And it does say in the syllabus, it says one week late. <laughs> That would be one day late in summer school. Okay. But anyway, I appreciate your uh, contributions in class. And um, I don't want to downplay that or anything. All right. So let's get started with... Um, this is, I started out the pre-class video by going through the Houston Smith outline. Perhaps it's redundant, not gonna do that again. And I started out with the article on women and you were asked to buy the book long time ago. So, you know, not having bought the book is, you know, an F for the class, sorry. Um, but again, there's consequences. So I would like each student to just comment. There's a number of patterns that I pointed out in the pre-class video that I would like you to recognize in every religion so that you don't, please, I don't like you getting on a high horse saying, oh, Christianity isn't like that. And I say, it sure was. <laughs> and for a lot of people, it still is. So try to understand this a little bit more. I have students in Asia University. This is not how, you know, they're raised to think. A lot of, some of them are Hindu and they were raised with perfect equality, Buddhist equality, Muslim equality, and some of them, most of them understand though, because they have friends that are raised with sexism in the name of religion. So. So the goal is just to make sure you liberate your mind from any sort of assumptions or fixations or superiority complexes or something. Um, so I'm gonna start with a woman, Akaya. What was your reaction? So I, I brought up like two points. So first I talked about like child matrimony. And then um, my second point was about the expectations leading to like a high rate of suicide. And it just stuck out to me because um, I know that in different countries, you have these families who are forcing their daughters to get married to like, they, they're marrying into rich families and the daughters may not want to do that. And so like you have their families who are expecting them, who are having these high expectations for them to get married rich. So their family can, you know what I'm saying, can live well also. And it's just like the girls, they might not want to do that. So they're like, oh, I don't, I'm not trying to deal with this. So I'm just going to end it all. So, yeah. Yeah, I think social media is affecting a lot of this. <laughs> social media is always like the common problem in things nowadays. Well, this might be helpful though, mm -hmm. right? So social media is, I mean, I think in the U.S. it's generally harmful because we do have access to good information and a lot of other stuff. But for people who had been isolated and really didn't know there was anything else, social media might be making them uppity, of course. 
but uh, hey, in a good way, right? Um, did anything you read surprise you? Surprise you? Mm. Nothing really just like stuck out to me because some of this, like the stuff that I read about, I had like already heard about it before. So I just um, brought up points that I thought were important to me. Okay, um, Caitlin, what about you? Um, hold on. Let me get to my so the first thing that I wrote down are two quotes that were kind of from like the beginning that just kind of like shocked me. Um, the first one was where it said she should patiently bear the beatings of her husband with patience by bearing them she will be free from her sins and it is possible that her husband may start loving her so that one kind of just shocked me um the second one was um though destitute of virtue or seeking pleasure elsewhere or devoid of good qualities a husband must be constantly worshipped as a god by a faithful wife so i didn't really like that one either um I feel like it's pretty obvious why those shocked me and I didn't like them. Um, the one where it said she will be free from her sins and it is possible that her husband may start loving her, like after beating her, that's that's just crazy to me. Um, and then I also, like we kind of talked about in the video too, um, like Hinduism, they have like multiple gods that are male and female rather than like Christianity or like monotheistic religions where we have one God that's like supposedly male. I mean, we relate to him or like father or Lord. So I just thought that was an interesting thing too, because especially like, just like you said earlier, like we don't think that Christian, we don't want need to think that Christ, Christianity has been better with sexism compared to like Hinduism. So especially until recently, right? Really, people told, you know, in the name of Christianity, men told women a whole lot of junk. <laughs> They're the source of evil. Okay, so Caitlin, um, do, you, do you find there's any problem between the first lecture I gave about Hinduism, it's all about energy and positive karma, and then all of a sudden this, yeah, it was kind of confusing because I felt like this, what I had read in that, that book was just like so different than what I thought at first of like Hinduism. So it was just kind of like, I don't know, I don't really know how to describe my feelings to it. If Hinduism is about getting in touch with the Atman, right, the infinite within, and infinite joy and infinite knowledge and infinite bliss. What the heck? <laughs> There's no connection, right, Caitlin? Uh, your mic is off, but... Um, all right, so the other thing, big thing, is if you can say the Atman, um, is in an earlier incarnation, early, a uh, more primitive, right? Less evolved Atman is, turns out to be a woman. And so if you behave yourself, maybe next time you'll become a man. So, so you're already suffering for past sins or something, or you just didn't make it to manhood. All of a sudden you can justify all sorts of negative relationships, right? Whereas the whole point was positive karma. Um, just a little doctrine thing like that. If you're a woman, you're in a previous incarnation. One little tweak and the whole idea of positive karma is just out the window. <laughs> all right, guys, keep that in mind. Uh, and also keep it in mind for yourself. I mean, be careful. Don't wipe out everything virtuous about a person or something because of some little 
thing they did or said or believe or something like that, right? Um, all right, so I'm gonna start with all three women. Sorry, guys. Okay, Mary Hannah. I feel like we're all harping on the um, women's beating up on how we were treated, but I also had one about that. My quotes were, um, a husband must be constantly worshiped as a God by a faithful wife. And I just think it's funny that we are called that they were called to worship their husband as if he were the higher power. Um, and then another one was a faithful wife who desires to dwell with her husband must never do anything that might displease him, um, whether he be alive or dead. So I just like relating that to times now, um, so many people like remarry. So like basically is that saying that even if your husband dies, like remarrying is a sin, like in their eyes. But that's just how I took that. And then in the beginning, it was talking about Hinduism privileges, the practice, practices of purification and of sacrifice, um, which I've actually heard a lot about, you know, fasting. I feel like a lot of religions did the fasting. Um, I could never, I just thought, I just can't imagine how people don't eat, but I just like that one. Yeah, I mean, I was in a Hindu country, I mean, a, a Muslim country when they had Ramadan. And, you know, these junior high kids, senior high, everybody was fasting and I just couldn't do it. <laughs> it was terrible because I really should have tried. I'm like, ah, please. And they also didn't drink. And this is in a hot, humid place. And they say that's the harder part. Not to, I mean, it's amazing. But it does show that they're serious, right? They're, they're disciplined in their religion, I think. I mean, I think that shows they have a lot more, you know, loyalty, obedience, whatever, because they're willing to pay the price. Um, anyway, it's humbling. <laughs> um, Okay, so now I want to see what the guys picked out and see if we can recognize any patterns here. Maybe they didn't think it was any problem. It's okay, worship your wife, no problem. What did you pick out, Trey? Well, first I just want to say um, I'm not a woman and I don't really know women's perspectives and stuff, but I know that I can like speak on like right from wrong for sure. So. The only thing that like really caught my attention was like the abortions part, the 95% abortions part. And it's, it's hard because like I, I related to like the world now and they're making like a lot of like state laws and stuff like that saying uh, women can't get abortions and stuff like that. And, and they were talking about it's like really violence against women. So I feel like some of this stuff doesn't really is it like is it's unwanted like some can happen unwantedly and other things can happen like kind of crazily and you don't really have the right to say over a woman what she can and cannot do with that because she might not be financially stable or there might be a lot of different other things that she's going through and i just feel like it's wrong in today's society now that you know, it's morally like men, but men and women at the same time, but just the fact that they have a say so and what what women what they can do or what they can and cannot do with that situation. So that's really that's so that's that's the big thing that peaked out for me, really. Well, it is interesting that in some places women are not allowed to have abortions, in other places they're forced to have abortions, right? It's men control them, whatever, that's what you're getting at, right? The other thing is when you accuse women of believing in abortion, nobody believes in abortion, right? No woman is going to get pregnant so that she can get a, an abortion because she believes in it. Do you understand that? That's just crazy. The issue comes up because they're caught, right? They have to make a decision where None of the options are good, right? 
And then it's just a whether they decide that's the best option. But in those situations, nobody would get pregnant just to get an abortion because they like that choice, right? Does everybody understand that? And it's just a matter of practical wisdom. Um, and there's lots of reasons, but, and then the other point is that globally, that 95% of abortions are female, right? And so there is a word called, well, there's a, one word, it's called femicide or gynocide, right? We don't have those words, yet millions of women are killed every year because they're women. So we definitely, that should be part of our language, right? Femicide or gynocide, gynecology, that's a, a Greek word for women. And just think about if that were part of your vocabulary, the way you would think about world history and the way you would think about what's going on right now in the world. You would have in your mind, there are millions of females being killed. Does everybody get that? that that's, but because there's no word and because, you know, the people in power don't really want you to see it, you don't see it. Um, so that uh, that's another lesson about learning how to see things with your mind, right? Not with your eyeballs, because you need to read about it, picture it, get a word for it, make it part of your worldview, right? So Trey might put that, you know, in his post saying, I would like to include this, just mainly because it isn't just about abortion. It's about all sorts of stuff and how it gets covered up or how it becomes a power issue or how it gets completely distorted. Like, um, I don't believe in abortion. Crazy language, right? Or, um, yeah, or someone says, I'm against it because I'm against murder. And it's like, obviously the people who get abortions don't think it's murder. <laughs> Or, right? Or, I mean, it's the way language gets manipulated. So, if you want to put a specific issue in your final world view, what you have to do is say, not just because of this issue, but because the patterns, right? It's just one example of all sorts of other things, um, all sorts of other trends and the way societies work and all that sort of stuff. Does that make sense to you, Trey? Okay, because again, I'm not gonna repeat this. In the pre-class video, I did talk about a lot about how the article just talks about trends, about this is the way sexism works in lots of different contexts. This is the way religion works in lots of contexts, so. Okay, good. What about you, Jason? Um, yeah, I was going to speak on the, the abortion part of it too. Um, like um, banning, like we well, you know, like how Trace was mentioning about, like how the, uh, now the certain uh, some states are like banning abortion and, and making it illegal. Like that's that's not necessarily going to help anyone or anything if anything it's just going to make the situation worse because then it'll lead to i think you mentioned it before um unsafe um abortions so um you know um i i hear you, sat here heard you talking about like you know people who believe in abortion not necessarily believe but like the language and how words are manipulated me personally the whole idea of abortion i'm 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 be honest i'm not for it but i do know like you know um banning the whole abortion in, in certain places like it's not going to help anybody um you know like you said it's just going to lead to more unsafe abortions and, and that could lead to even and not only and in, in some cases like it, it'd be detrimental for the mother as well so um that's all i had for it it's a little brief but well there's i mean there have been fewer abortions since it's become legal five years after. So there are actually fewer abortions if it's legal and there's birth control and there's sex ed and there's 
uh, less poverty because women get them when they're too poor to have another kid or when they're uh, teenagers. That's why they get them. So they're going to get them anyway. <laughs> uh, so if they have money and friends, they'll fly to Canada. If they don't, they go underground, they get butchered. Happens every time. <laughs> And I think I, um, I'm speaking more in the, I wouldn't say like nationwide, but uh, I guess more in the case of Texas, uh, Texas being a, a really red state and um, being from Texas. So like that kind of popped into my head because they're always passing, um, wh whether it's like some against Planned Parenthood or uh, abortions and uh, just stuff that has to do with like woman's body in general. Actually Planned Parenthood does more to prevent abortions a lot more than any other organization because they do hand out condoms and they do teach sex ed, right? They go to the places where poor people are, they do sex ed, they hand out condoms, it lowers the abortion level, but they also help with cervical cancer, ovarian cancer, pap smears, I mean, it's all about women's health. It's not just about abortions. They also, you know, they they give the pill so that women don't get, it's just, the rhetoric is just terrible. So if you want to write about it, you have to say, okay, this is a case of powerful rhetoric, but it's not the only case, right? You've got to show me that it's a pattern, right? that politicians use this as a wedge issue. Well, what other issues do they use as wedge issues? Or how do they create a brand? How does that, you know, get, it has nothing to do with creating a middle class, right? It's one more way to, to shrink the middle class. So anyway, I do want you to try to see how everything's connected. That's, that's why you take a course like this, rather than just, you know, read stuff on your own. Um, all right, so I, I do think it's interesting that of course the women picked out the overall way of life and relationships, right? <laughs> and the guys sort of picked up one issue. I think that's interesting. Like, what does that tell you about, I don't know, what people would identify with um, anyway, you can reflect on that. I don't really want to, I just always think things like that are meaningful. When you, you know, you are writing down your reactions. What does that tell you about yourself? That's why I like you to build on this, right? You're learning about yourself while you're learning about this other stuff. Um, all right. So let me go to the next thing. Um, uh, let's see, environment. Um, let me go to the environment. I don't think we got to this last time in terms of your reactions to this, did we? Did you have time to react to the article on Hinduism and the environment? <laughs> Anybody gonna answer? <laughs> Cause I did put it in the post last time. I just, so naturally it makes total sense. That's why I put it in last time we were doing positive karma. It makes sense that Hinduism would have been very much based on sustainability and um, uh, you know, the, he just talks a lot about this history of um, respect for nature and um, I also think I like what he says about that there are a lot of environmentalists that um, are anti-religion and so I do want to give you you know an alternative view which is um, until recently, the role of culture and religion, spiritual heritage was ignored, right? Because they kept focusing on science. Um, 
They're afraid that bringing religion in will threaten objectivity, right? Professionalism. But none of this needs, uh, none of this need be displaced in order to include the spiritual dimension. Um, from the perspective of many world religions, the abuse and exploitation of nature for immediate gain is unjust, immoral, and unethical. So um, there really isn't any reason to split science from religion in the case of environmental protection. So I do want all of you to react to that, unless for some reason last time you already did it. I don't think so. Um, Trey. Could you repeat that question again? I kind of like. Well, what is your view of the relationship between religion and environmental sustainability? Uh, so as I was reading this, um, it picked, I picked out uh, like, so Buddhism, they, they wrote Buddhism protects the environment. And that's really what I was going to speak on too. I feel like it's kind of our job to protect the world and protect the environment because if we were living in like a poorly environment like system, basically we would be, you know, breathing in kind of toxins and all that kind of crazy stuff. So, and then a lot of places in the world, like I've seen a couple of videos or so where they've had kind of like trash just like everywhere from not because they had it, but like it came somewhere. I'm not really, really familiar where it came from, but it just kind of ended up on the place or whatever. So, I mean, and then, you know, I'm, I, we do build up a lot of trash and stuff like that. So I'm gonna just say like, it's basically our job to protect the environment and protect the ecosystem as much as we can, cause we don't want to live in a poorly, you know, polluted city and stuff like that to where we just can't live freely. And I feel like that would definitely uh, affect our emotions and stuff like that, the way we act if we did live in such a, like a, an environment as that. Do you think that's a scientific value, a religious value or both? Um, I would say religious because I feel like um, God put us on the earth to you know, work and, and do things such as we could to, to protect the world and stuff like that. Cause he kind of gave us all the stuff that, you know, he, he that did bless us with like trees and waters and all that good stuff. But as we go on, we kind of like more improve the world and stuff like that. So I could see that more as like a religion based thing. That scientific, I would, I don't think so. Well, the science, 97 out of a hundred climate scientists say we're heading for disaster, right? So they agree on that, that's not a problem. It's just whether religion is a part of the problem, the reason people don't, the reason they ignore the scientists, or if religious people add something, right? That they, the scientists can say all they want, but if people say, yeah, but I think God will come and save it if he wants to, I can ignore that. Or if you unite reason and faith, then you say, but, Religion brings in these further issues of hubris, pride, and greed. And people who do believe in an afterlife should think they're going to roast in hell for doing this. Does that make sense, Trey? Yes, well. Okay. Because there's some religious people that say, as long as you turn to Jesus, it doesn't matter. Do you know that? Mm -hmm. Okay. So that, that, that's the main question I'm asking you here. Was there something you picked out in the article? And then that general question of reason and faith. Um, Akaya, what do you think? Um, so I, my points were, I don't know my notes. You guys, you have such poker faces. The way you were looking was like, Really, we're supposed to do this. I was like, didn't I? And, and now here it is. Yes, I did. And here you are. You're prepared. <laughs> so I, go ahead. Um, I brought up two things. Um, first, I brought up like when it talked about reduce, reducing competition among people for limited resources. I thought that that was very important because I know um, you hear a lot about people when they try to outdo somebody or do something better than someone. You you have people who ask for help and they're like, no, like as if they were too good to help that person. And then I also talked about the, that 
Montrose had it pulled up. All lives have the equal right and value to existence. And so like I thought about, I not only thought about like human lives, but I thought about like animal lives and stuff like that. You know, you have people who test out products on animals. These animals don't really know what's going on. And then um, as far as like lives and having an equal right and value to existence, there was this, um, I don't know if you guys heard about it, but it was like a massacre, um, the Jonestown or Jamestown massacre or whatever. It was about this man, uh, he was a reverend and he wanted like all of his people to travel into the afterlife together. So he like made them kill themselves and like there were children involved and it's like the children didn't know what were, what was going on. So it's unfair to them that they have to, you know, do something that you want to do, but you know, they don't know what's really going on. So that's what stuck out to me. 800 people drank the Kool-Aid. Uh, so the idea is made in the image of God, right? Is that what you're getting at, Akaya? Okay. So do you think this, the value of animals and people and all that um, is a religious value or a scientific value or both? Um, you said between humans and animals, right? Well, everything you said about competition for limited resources, all lives have equal value. Mm -hmm. um, do you get that, would you say, from studying science or even social science, that societies where people care about each other work better, or is it religion? Is it just what you think God wants? I'd say scientific okay. wise. And then I know that God does want us to live like by his word and stuff like that, but I say more scientifically than religiously. Okay. Do you think, are they split or could they be combined? I feel like they could be combined, but I'm like, I'm not sure how. I just feel scientific wise, it's more appropriate. Okay. So again, in your final worldview, you can figure this out, right? Every single lecture is about that. <laughs> okay. In case you haven't noticed, hint, hint. Okay. Um, let's see, where are we? Jason. Um, I would say, um, as far as like people saying, um, oh, no, it's okay. Um, you know, we're, we're going to be saved. You know, God's going to come down uh, and save us. Um, and so they'll just neglect the whole environmental thing, but, um, I could be mistaken, correct me if I'm wrong. I don't know if anybody here knows, but I'm pretty sure somewhere along in the Bible, it, uh, it does mention something about uh, taking care of your environment. So I'm sure um, we didn't get put on this earth just to trash it. Now, um, it is obviously, um, you know, for Christians and uh, shooting for the afterlife, but that don't mean uh, just throw away this life and throw away what we have here. Granted, um, yeah, I, I just, don't think that like you know when, when people say oh it's okay because you know we'll be saved we, we yeah but like you know, that don't mean you know just throw away what we got here like and take care of it like i said i'm pretty almost positive some in the bible or a certain scripture that mentions um it might be new testament i think uh probably uh or gospel somewhere along there uh jesus mentioned something about taking care of your environment i could be wrong though but Consider the lilies, how they grow. <laughs> he used a lot of metaphors that had natural images in them. Um, but, you know, in the Garden of Eden, uh, God says, you know, to, it's interpreted. Are you supposed to master the earth to the point where you destroy the creation? Or are you supposed to be in a covenant relationship with the earth, right? You're taking care of it for God, right? So you can think about that. That's Those are big debates in environmental ethics. Um, and then you can think about the relation between science and religion and social science. Like, how do you run a good society in general? And how would you at this point in time? 
because given that resources are going to become more and more limited, should we worry even more about having a middle class so that we share? Or should we just let it devolve into a war, right? For water, food, and what would God want, right? Does that make sense, Jason? Yes, ma'am. Okay, and so the main thing is Hindus, the Hindu tradition, they can definitely refer to sustainability as a much more consistent value in their in much more obvious. But still, there's plenty of Hindus that are completely brainwashed by American capitalism. <laughs> um, all right, so let's see. Mary Hannah. Okay. Um, one that really stuck out to me was all lives have equal value and same right to existence. So I started thinking about that quote and I was thinking like, all humans of all color, but then to the extent of all animals and plants, then I started thinking about insects. So like, is it wrong <laughs> to kill a spider? You know, that's kind of creepy. But then um, it says no damage may be inflicted on other species without justification. So is it right to kill a spider if it is on you, if it's going to bite you, you know? Um, and then it talks a lot about duties to animals and just creation in itself. And I begin to think of, I know some, there are religions that do and don't think that animals go to heaven. And that just kind of sparked that idea in my head. Really? Okay. It kind of made me sad. I, I know there are a lot of pre, what we would call primitive religions indigenous religions have a spirit all the trees have a spirit right mm -hmm. each of the uh creatures has their own spirit which is over and above just the physical part right um i just remember my brother my older brother he's always been the rebellious one and has to do something different than all the other ones so he began to go to a different church than we did whenever he was in high school because he was old enough to follow his own beliefs and which he was so he did and I will never forget my dog my golden retriever dying and him coming and mom's like it's okay you'll meet her again in heaven and he's like no you won't dogs just die they don't go to heaven and I got sad but um yeah those are my main points but a lot of this um reading it rereading it now that I've read some of the readings for today relate to the um some of the readings for today about the non non-violence and basically when things are justified and when they're not i just think that's all very interesting okay what about you caitlin um so my ideas were kind of like scattered in what i had written down um but based on that overall question of like is it science or religion i feel like it's both i feel I feel like being virtuous and like a moral person ties into like taking care of the environment because I mean I wrote down God created the earth so like why would we destroy it like I think that in the not in the beginning but like when like climate change first became such a big problem I think it was like unintended consequences but like now that we realize what we're doing. Nobody wants to really make sacrifices for change. And so that is a big problem. Um, and I think that taking care of the earth is important because I think God would want us to take care of his creation. And I think that if we take care of the earth, it'll take care of us. So it's just kind of like, I feel like it's kind of religious and scientific, but I guess like my belief is mostly religious because I wouldn't want to destroy something that God gave us to live. Yeah, okay, sounds good. Um, okay, so now I'll go to the next. Um, issue. Um, okay, the, um, nope. 
This one was the article on Gandhi and the One-Eyed Giant. Did I have an outline of it? It's mostly that the West is one-sided. No, I didn't have an outline on that. Um, let me see if I had an outline there. I'm, I was, I'm going to read you something about his life. Here, I just picked some excerpts. So um, let me ask you which, what st struck out, uh, stuck out to you about that article. So um, now I need to go backwards or inside out. Who did I start? Let's start with Mary Hannah here. So did it have to, be, have to be from that excerpt or can it just be from the reading? Oh, no, it's from the reading would be better. Yeah, the excerpt is just the cheat sheet. So if you actually read it, show me. That would be very good, very wise. Um, sorry, there's a dog too and on a spooky toy in the background. But um, one quote that made me compare like the reasoning of this class and just like a liberal arts education, it was, he was able to show men of the West and of the whole world a way to recover their own right mind and their own tradition, thus manifesting the fact that there are certain indisputable and essential values, religi religious, ethical, blah, blah, blah. So basically, um, he took like little bits and parts of um, Christianity and just like made it into what he believed in and what was right in his right mind. So I think that's like weighing your options and like doing research and just like coming up with what you think is right. And I just feel like that's kind of what we're doing in this class is just going off a lot of different things to work on our worldview. And then another quote that stood out to me, which there were a lot, but I'm not gonna read the whole thing. Um, he tends to liberate the truth in himself by seeking true liberty for all. And this just made me think of um, a quote from Aristotle and it was basically like you are what you repeatedly do um, I use that in my paper but I didn't write it completely down but that was like our quote of our high school because um, it's like eventually then you form habits and habits form character and it goes on and on but I just think like when you dive into your thoughts like working to make a difference will make you adapt to those beliefs and like you seek change in yourself overall and I'm sure I could go on. Um, so here's one. Um, here's a quote. At the same time, the cooperation of the whole Indian people and in the sacrificial and religious art of nonviolent self-liberation was a necessary sign to the rest of the world, a witness that would enable all peoples, especially those subject to colonists, uh, to take the same measures for the restoration of the order will by God. And this just like made me realize that good behavior is contagious. And it's almost like saying like, live like Jesus because he did the right thing. And I just feel like whenever you seek those changes, someone will always follow and it's kind of going into that leadership. And I just think it's kind of a domino effect. Um, if one person does it, there will soon be more to follow. So those were just a few that or my favorites. But hiding behind words is very dangerous, right? Yeah, so religion can be a weapon, right? It's a powerful weapon. Yeah, For so you have to be careful. The other thing, remember when we read about Euthyphro, do the gods love it because it's holy or is it holy because the gods love it, right? And so Gandhi was deciding the gods love it because it's holy. So I have to figure out what holiness is in every religion, right? Does that make sense, Mary Hannah, that we're kind of going back to that? Yes, ma'am. That's like the point that I connected through it. Right. And then the Sermon on the Mount, he actually, that's where, again, the excerpts I gave you was the Sermon on the Mount. That's what Gandhi said. He said, that's basically, in a nutshell, Right, and so that's that's kind of helpful. You know what he's referring to. Does that make sense? Anybody else want to comment to Mary Hannah? Anybody want to go next? 
Oh, good. Akaya. Oh, wow. Yay. All well, right. I'll go because um, Mary Hannah brought up one of my quotes, her very first quote about um, Gandhi and how he like discovered his own right mind and helped others discover their own right mind. I feel like that's important because like once you discover yourself and the things you can do, it makes you more confident and then you can like realize your own creativity. And then it also reminded me of Confucius and his concepts of like Jin and Chun Tzu about like the relationships between people and then the relationship with yourself and being able to um, find yourself and help others find themselves. So I thought that was really important and I thought it was really cool. Good. Anything else, Akaya? Um, I also had um, that in the excerpt, it talked about how he neither accepted Christianity nor did he reject it but Mary Hannah she just she talked about everything that I wanted to talk about so I really don't have anything else to say okay um I will say when I was in Indonesia I was supposed to give a lecture on why the United States is the best country in the world or something and I said no <laughs> I said, you shouldn't try to be like the US. You should make, you should be the best Indonesia you can be, right? Don't try to make yourself into America. It's a different country. Um, and I did point out some problems with America that they would be clueless about, actually. <laughs> um, go ahead, Mary Hannah, are you raising your hand? Um, yeah, like just like basically off that you said. First of all, if someone ever asked me that, I would say, I don't know, because I don't know about enough about other countries and other places. But also, I feel like as a leader or someone um, wanting to change something, you should take like the best in every situation, like and just compare the goods, like take the goods from every place. And I feel like that's kind of how Gandhi did, because he kind of just took what he thought was um right in the bible and you know just kind of made his own so right they compared that was after he had tried to make himself western right right yeah that happens a lot and it's happening a lot now a lot more it's called post-colonialism you know exposing colonialism and um these developing countries coming up with their own models for how to do how to do uh democracy actually that was Indonesia had come up with their own model. Um, okay, Trey, what would you like to say? Whoops, he's talking to somebody. Um, Trey, do you wanna say something? Yeah, so from the reading, I got this quote. It says, he was the king of quantity and the driver of those forces over which quantitative knowledge gave him supremacy without understanding because he ruled matter without understanding it, he faced his bodily self as an object which he could not comprehend through what he could analyze and tamper with this every part. So I was just thinking about it and I was like, well, this really, you know, resembles to like Christianity and the Bible and everything going on. And it seems to me as if it was talking about God and Jesus basically going through it. So God sent himself in a form of a human to take the pain and the understanding of all that's been going on and with what's been happening. And so I kind of like revolved it back to the uh, Adam and Eve, knowing that they, you know, ate the apple and they got they got the knowledge from the tree of knowledge or whatever. Uh, I guess what was kind of trying to happen was maybe uh, Satan was like putting knowledge into the humans and maybe God's not understanding of what was happening. And he came down and kind of like, was trying to figure out what's going on, what's happening, like what's happening, you know? And then and then he, he finally understood it. And then he was like, oh, okay, I see what's happening now. And so here's what I'm gonna do. And then he, you know, did his holy things in holy ways. And so that just really stuck out to me. And then I went back again to read the title cause I didn't read the title and it said, uh, I don't know the name, God, Gahan, Gahan and the one-eyed giant. So that's why I was like, whoa, I was like, maybe they are talking about like God and Jesus you know, at the same time. That's just what I got from that. Well, the one-eyed giant is Western culture. And he's saying Westerners know science. They have scientific knowledge, 
but they don't have um, spiritual knowledge. They don't have understanding, right? So, I mean, a great case of that is Hitler. The Germans were really high tech wizards, right? And they used their high tech to gas 6 million people, right? So you can have a lot of scientific knowledge and not have values or a sense of your place in the universe. Um, we, so we have a lot of science and so far we've used it to destroy life on earth, right? And I think, you know, that that's, that to think that we can put God on a timetable and say, oh God, I guess you decided to destroy the creation just so happens in my lifetime, but I'm sure you would not not want me to drive my gas guzzling vehicle. You know, that couldn't possibly be true. <laughs> so you must've decided to end the world. You know, I, that strikes me as a bit arrogant. What about you, Trey? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's crazy. Cause you know, I just, I, I think there's so much that he's done and well, I think there's just so much going on and to, to take all the pain and suffering and all the actions and stuff and just take it as his form is kind of crazy. Cause I know for a fact, I wouldn't be able to take all of that stuff just going crazy. I, I wouldn't be able to do it. But the fact that he did that for us and if y'all don't believe it, but the fact that that happened, I, I'm really am blessed and truly thankful that that happened. I remember when I had little kids, I started to understand that better because I just felt like I would run in front of a truck to save my kid's life. You know, you just, and you wouldn't think twice, really. You would just hope that the moment came where you could actually choose your life over the kid's life and you would do it. Um, sometimes you freeze, you know, you wouldn't get the situation. And then if the kid died, you would just, torture yourself forever but it it did help me to understand that though you know um so let's see so the the general idea is that the west has specialized in science remember when i had that cultural selection where the west was science and confucius was relationships and india was the inner life was that like on the first page of the Confucius outline? But um, so we can like, we can analyze the body. You guys learn tons of science. We can know all this biology. And yet here we are destroying the earth and destroying our bodies just with our science, right? It's, it's absolutely nuts. Uh, we know that plastic has uh, endocrine disruptors that affect the reproductive system. And we know that uh, two thirds, some huge number, 40% of couples are infertile. And, you know, we just keep going. It, and that's where Gandhi would say, we've lost our mind, right? And Jesus did say, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And he uses that word noose, which is, the ancient wisdom is focused on educating the noose. So um, does that make sense to you, Trey? Yeah. And then uh, kind of going along with that also, I read this scripture from the Bible and I, I saved it. It was on my phone. So it says that uh, for even in, uh, I'm going to just say a name, the, the soul in the, you sent aid once again for my necessities, not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abunds to your account. So I just kind of think of that as like, there's still a little bit that like of, of something wrong that we don't understand why we do it, but continuously do. Um, I feel like that that see, I seek the gift, but the fruit that abunds to your account. I see that how that kind of like attaches onto us kind of like as a little bit of like something that's still happening, maybe that's going on, that's, that's evil. Yeah, well, we have bad habits for sure, right? And um, yeah, okay, so Jason, have I called on you so far? Uh, no, ma'am. Go ahead. Um, from the reading, there was one, um, there was one that uh, quote that really stuck out to me where uh, Gandhi's, 
talking about um, liberating the oppressors themselves from um, okay in, in the way in, in the system in which they were like oppressing others and but not only that but like pretty much stuck in their materialistic ways and I I think that kind of goes back to what you're uh, mentioning about how like um, the West is like very scientific and even uh, in Germany Nazi Germany yet we lack um, a lot of values more values um you know, we sacrifice a lot of things to make big jumps, but is, um, you know, we think bigger pictures are really worth it. Um, you know, I, you basically just took like what I was going to talk about, how like, you know, um, the West, uh, the U.S. in general, like, again, like I said, like ex extremely like technology wise, like very, very, very uh, scientific yet. Like you can see, like, I wouldn't even go as far as to say our political leaders. Um, and even people, um, not even the leaders itself, but like just the population is like, we, there's a lot of um, values that are lacking. Um, and I think that kind of goes back again to um, what he says about like liberating the oppressors, because then you know, it's kind of like a top down type of thing. So once they're liberated and then it just follows down all the way down to the bottom of the pyramid kind of thing. Okay, good. And then Caitlin, I think you're the last one. Um, okay, so the first quote that I wrote down that stuck out to me was, um, it's kind of different than everything we've been talking about, but it was, white man has always naturally blamed the traditional ancient cultures and the primitive savages who he never understood. And I think that one kind of stuck out to me because we've talked before about how I don't know if we've really talked about it, but like how we don't like things that we don't understand. And I think that also kind of relates to like, um, like the Black Lives Matter stuff we talked about, how like um, it said naturally blind other cultures, basically, um, just because he didn't understand. So I, that kind of stuck out to me relating to what we talked about before. Um, where's the other one? Uh, the second one I wrote down, violence is essentially wordless and it can begin only where thought and rational communication have broken down. Any society which is geared for violent action is by that very fact systematically unreasonable and inarticulate. And I thought that was interesting because um, it just shows that like thought and rational communication is so important in society. And I think that can also relate to like um, what we're talking about with the environment because um i feel like not necessarily violence but how we treat the environment just shows no like rational thought and if we were rational in our thinking and like systematically reasonable then i think we wouldn't be having so much trouble like fixing the problems that we started in the beginning yeah, we're a notoriously violent country. Part of that has to do with taming the frontier, but, you know, homicides, suicides. Um, it's partly because we have the data, but our destruction of the natural world, uh, domestic abuse, child abuse, um, capital punishment. We have very few countries have capital punishment we're right up there with Sudan or something. Uh, we score really high and <laughs> the number of people we kill. Um, so anyway, I for whatever else you may think, we are a very violent country. And so we go back to that where our founding fathers were enlightenment thinkers and they trusted in reason and they wanted to educate the citizens so they would follow reason in their behavior as a citizen. And then they let all these people come in who came from religious traditions that split reason from faith. The founders did not. But they kept saying, that's fine in church, but not when you're trying to solve community problems and not when you're acting as a citizen. And so, you know, when we start combining them in politics, right? We are, our policies have become a lot less rational because we don't hold our politicians accountable to have rational policies. 
we, you know, and in general, they can talk about God and that's good enough for a lot of people. But that isn't what our founders wanted. Um, anyway, just for you to think about, you know, how do you want the political system to work in terms of the relationship between reason and faith? Okay, so now I have 20, 15, 20 minutes. And I do want to talk more about Gandhi, if that's okay. Um, so this is from a book about his life and about nonviolent, his nonviolent movement. And I did have that outline about this. So I'm reading, I'm taking um, that outline that I gave you. This is excerpts, or these are the original, this is the original prose. Um, Okay, so he was born, he was shy. He got married at age 13 and his relation to his wife was not good. He started bossing her around when he was 13. Uh, yeah, okay, and they never really got along real well. Then he went to London and he tried desperately to imitate the British. He went to the Sermon on the Mount, that's what we read, tremendous impact. Um, then he turned back to the Bhagavad Gita, like he, he, he hadn't even thought about it growing up, but he went and found his own mind as a Hindu. Um, okay, so let's see. The ideal action, so he's on the path of action. So his nonviolent resistance, he considers to be the path of action. Um, he was... Uh, there is this tradition, the great yogis, the great souls are the ones that when the universe comes down, uh, Vishnu comes back in the form to try and redeem the world. So um, Jesus as the Messiah was not the first time the same sort of story was told. Um, he went back to India. He wasn't very um, accomplished. He failed pretty much. Um, and then there were two events that happened to him that converted him, right? Turned him around. And it was a turning from accepting white supremacy, accepting that the West was more evolved, trying to become more Western, to all of a sudden realizing these people are wicked and racist. And so his brother needed legal assistance and he tried to get help. There's a movie of this and it's very impressive if you want to see it. It's really a nice movie because it could apply to anyone. It could, and again, there's lots of movies about African-Americans also, so it's not the only movie, but it is you know, a movie Martin Luther King imitated Gandhi. His movement, he, Gandhi had come not that long before. So he was an inspiration. To Martin Luther King. Um, so he, and then in South Africa, he got kicked out of the first class uh, car in the train and he had tried so hard, right? And all of a sudden he realized they don't care, right? Um, so then he started getting involved. Um, and I do want to point out this quote because I, I hear about students at Lyon that actually do this and it's also in the news, how people can feel honored by humiliating other people, right? And intellectuals do that too, right? They trash stupid people, you know, uninformed people. It's just like, why? I just, um, I just really have trouble with that. Any kind of self-righteousness, any kind of superiority, any kind of having to humiliate another person, I think it's really sick. Um, it probably has to do with insecurities, but you should know that and not do it, right? It's your problem. Anyway, so he organized an ambulance corps um, because the British didn't want to admit they would need these people, but eventually um, he started changing the paradigm for what it means to be a good dad. Um, he, he started breaking down the class structure. So he's a, re a rebel, right? He's outside of the norm. He's radical. Um, his religion made him political and his politics were religious. So 
he kept that distance. You know, he kept in contact with his inner Atman and then he acted, but he didn't let his ego get caught up in it. He didn't score points. He didn't try to see, you know, what the consequences. He just kept doing the right thing. Um, so this is how, you know, a story of how it happened. And um, he advocated simple living. Um, the caste system was very, you know, harmful. Let's see. And this is where he, this is where I was going to start to read was the, um, uh, was this the massacre? Okay, so it was in a salt works. So the way the British would exploit India is they would have them grow tea and then the British would, it would export to Britain. The factories would make it into tea bags and they'd sell it back to India or their other colonies at like a 400 time markup, right? Because you made it into a tea bag and they controlled the whole system. You know, there was no competition. And then also with salt, the same thing. And so Gandhi uh, arranged, and also with cotton cloth, obviously they grow cotton and then it was made into, into cotton back in Britain, into clothes, and then they were exported. So Gandhi had this self-sufficiency movement where they were gonna make their own salt. He had everybody weaving their own cloth uh, and he would have thousands of people in rows doing this so that, you know, you get this message, we're going to do this. Um, so with the salt massacre, there was, there was a ditch that they had to go down into and then go and, and there was the factory there, whatever. And they were engaged in nonviolent resistance. Like this was illegal and they were purposely breaking the law, just like Martin Luther King and getting arrested, right? Just to resist, just to show that we're not gonna let this go on. And so the story of the massacre is that um, on May 4th, um, Gandhi was arrested the night before the planned demonstration. So, um, okay, he was going to raid the salt works, 105, uh, five miles. Okay. Let's see. Um, here's, here's the picture of it. The second son of the Gandhi advanced at the head of the uh, marchers. So they had lines of marchers, 25 people in a line. And then they went down to raid the salt works and um, they got beaten. Okay. Um, 400 Surat policemen. So the other way you oppress people is that you have six British officers and they make the command, but you had 400 native Indian policemen who had the clubs. So it was their own people who actually clubbed them, okay? In complete silence, the Gandhi men drew up and halted a hundred miles from the stockade. A picked column advanced, waded the ditches and approached the stockade. The officers ordered them to retreat, but they kept going. Suddenly the native policemen rushed upon them and rained blows on their heads. Okay, steel, steel covered clubs, all right? Blow to the head. All right, not one of the marchers even raised an arm to fend off the blows. They went down like 10 pins. From where I stood, I heard the sickening whack of the clubs on unprotected skulls. The waiting crowd of marchers groaned and sucked in their breath in sympathetic pain. Those struck down fell sprawling, unconscious or writhing with fractured skulls or broken shoulders. The survivors, without breaking rank, silently and doggedly marched on until they were struck down. When the first column was laid low, another column advanced, although everyone knew that within a few minutes he would be beaten down, perhaps killed. I could detect no sign of wavering or fear. 
They march steadily with their heads up. I always cry about this. I'm sorry. I try every time and I can't help it. Without the encouragement of music or cheering or any possibility, they might escape injury or death. The police rushed out and methodically and mechanically beat down the second column. There was no fight, no struggle. They simply walked forward until they were struck down. Another group of 25 advanced. The police commenced savagely kicking the seated men in the abdomen and testicles. Another column presented itself. Enraged, the police dragged them by their arms and feet and threw them in the ditches. Um, another, let's see, hour, okay. Hour after hour, hour after hour, okay? They did this. Um, the stretcher bearers, ca bearers carried back a stream of inert, bleeding men, right? Then they arrested the people on top. The raids and beatings continued for several days. Can you picture this, guys? Several days. That means thousands and thousands and thousands of Native Indians getting beaten to death or all near death by their own people under the orders of the British. Okay, so this is what the, the reporter says. India was now free, legally, <laughs> sorry, Legally, technically, nothing had changed. India was still a British colony, but there was a difference. He told, Tagore told the Manchester Garden, Europe has completely lost her formal moral prestige in Asia. She's no longer regarded as the champion throughout the world of fair dealing and the exponent of high principle, but of but as the upholder of Western race supremacy and the exploiter of those outside her own borders. For Europe, this is an actual fact, a great moral defeat. Even though Asia is physically weak and unable to protect herself from aggression, where her vital interests are menaced, nevertheless, she can now afford to look down on Europe, where before she looked up. The salt march and its aftermath did two things. It gave the Indians the conviction they could lift the foreign yoke from their so shoulders, and it made the British aware that they were subjugating India. It was inevitable that India would someday refuse to be ruled and that England would someday refuse to rule. When the Indians allowed themselves to be beaten with batons and rifle butts and did not cringe, they showed that England was powerless and India was invincible. The rest was merely a matter of time. So this is where I just want to say that spiritual reality is powerful, right? It's, does that make sense? And, you know, it's interesting with Black Lives Matter also, because the story there is about social media and about the capacity of our net, our news networks to just pick little pieces <laughs> of what went on because you know people might have seen just violence even though 93% of the demonstrations were nonviolent right and and time after time i would you know i would see interviews with black people who just persisted and they just kept saying, you know, and so it's, it's my perception of it, right, is that racism is so obviously false. Like we have all these African Americans in these high positions with high moral values who just keep, John Lewis got beaten 60 times in nonviolent demonstrations, right? But still, you know, the people disagree and they resist. But I mean, I'm hoping, right, the spirit changes. Um, but that's how we felt with Martin Luther King. But, you know, 50 years later, it's a lot of the same patterns.
because people keep telling their children the same stuff and they keep interpreting history, right? They tell a story of what's going on. So all I'm asking for you all, right, is to just open up your minds and think about the stories that you get told or the stories that you hear in the news. Um, and the other, oh, the other point is about the way Churchill treated Gandhi. Um, okay, so there was a round table conference attended by Indians met in London. It came to nothing because they didn't invite, you know, the resistance movement. And then um, Winston Churchill was, was forced to meet with Gandhi. And I don't, you know, the story of Winston Churchill that we hear is he inspired the, the British to go underground and stay in the subway system while the Germans bombed and he just, you know, inspired them. Okay, that's great, Mr. Churchill. But I did not hear this story growing up. Uh, Winston Churchill was revolted by, quote, the nauseating and humiliating spectacle of this one-time lawyer, now a seditious religious leader, striding half naked up the steps of the Viceroy's palace, there to negotiate on equal terms with the representative of the King Emperor. Churchill's anger and contempt undisguised and ferocious, did not blur his vision. He grasped the fact, which was not, um, but of uh, the fact that the equality Gandhi had required and was asserting with the Viceroy. Gandhi had not come to petition for favors. He came as a leader of a nation to negotiate on equal terms. And, um, but the British had no intention of giving India freedom or any kind of rights. Winston Churchill uh, was always guided by this dictum. I have not become the King's minister in order to preside at the liquidation of the British empire. He detested uh, Gandhi. Um, Gandhiism and all it stands for must be grappled with and crushed, said Churchill. Um, all right. I mean, that wasn't the story I ever hear about Churchill. Does that make sense to you guys? I don't know if do you guys hear stories about Winston Churchill. Is this great British leader? All right. Anyway, guaranteed um, that you hear different stories. And um, for next time, I will read a little bit more about Gandhi's theology. Um, he talked about truth force, and that was, Martin Luther King was very much inspired by Gandhi. Does everybody understand how Martin Luther King would have known this history and been inspired by it? Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, just there's this long tradition in it, and we still have a lot of nonviolent movements, and they still are inspired. They know these books, they know these characters. And they know these philosophical principles. They know the four steps to nonviolence. Um, so, I mean, and I do think there's going to be a lot more such movements in your time. Like there are going to be movements for, well, you know how gay, lesbian, transgender, and but there's going to be more on race. There's going to be stuff on climate change. There's going to be stuff on um, pr uh, probably the wealth gap because it's gotten so bad. There just will be, where there was a um, Occupy Wall Street movement that was really focused on the wealth, um, wealth gap. So um, I hope, you know, I'm just giving you, I just do think you need to know the tradition. I was surprised to find that most students don't because of course <laughs> I grew up marching in the, in the things and my dad did, it was just part of our life. But it's all up to you what you want to do. And, you know, I could easily disagree with you on various ways you use the nonviolent tradition. So I'm not doing it for some kind of agenda. 
but I, you don't have a democracy unless you have nonviolent resistance or nonviolent criticism, uh, public criticism, mass criticism. Um, you just don't have a democracy unless you, you do these things to keep a nation honest and examining itself. Um, any, uh, it just seems like a lot of you read a lot of stuff for today and I really appreciate that a lot. <laughs> I just thought, will they really have read this? And it, it seems like you did. Uh, so bravo, uh, shout out to my students. And yeah, and I do know a lot of you are behind, but I did tell you at least be prepared for the day. Um, and again, I don't have office hours tonight or tomorrow night, but after that, I'll, I'll be free. I will be reading papers like mad. But um, if you want to meet with me at a certain time, because your work schedules are crazy, I will have a lot more time available from Thursday on. Is that okay? Any other questions or comments? Go ahead, Mary Hannah. So will we present our papers tomorrow? Oh, I forgot. I forgot. Uh, again, you guys, you could have told me, but anyway, this was good. We did get the whole Hindu thing. I didn't know if that was because last time we presented papers, we didn't do any of the. That's reading. true. I mean, that so is I didn't know what your plan was. Um, and yeah, I usually let you talk it out um, and ask each other questions. So yeah, we'll have to present the papers first thing um, tomorrow. And those of you, I don't know, how many of you are finished already? Everybody finished? Trey, did you finish writing your third paper? Good, and Jason, anyway, well, good for you guys. And you could give me a heads up, of course, anytime when I don't do what I say. <laughs> okay. And then I have one more other thing. On the um, notes that are the reflection that will be due Wednesday, I think it's still like through the individual day instead of like Monday and Tuesday together. Oh no, it's together. So just one document, right? Yeah, I was just looking on um, Google Classroom. But. So on Google Classroom, I do have it listed that, you know, post number so-and-so. I think we're seven. Yep. You're on seven, but each one is for two days, right? Right. I just didn't see it on here. Oh, I probably haven't posted that one yet. Okay. Yeah. So, so far, post number six is due for those two classes. Nope. I haven't posted that one yet. Okay. I've been running by the seat of my pants here. Um, so, I'm still back at uh, last summer, right? June 17th. Um, so I will redo that one. Does that make sense, Mary Hannah? Yes, ma'am. I'll, I have got to run to the store right now and then I have office. Oh, it's fun. No, I, don't, I didn't mean right now. I'll just, That's, I was just reminding you. Yes. Okay, thanks. Uh, Trey. Uh, so for the schedule, uh, like next week, we're gonna, I'm gonna be doing football. So like me and Titus or Jason included, we're gonna be like football stuff and we're probably gonna be like busy and doing stuff around like 6.15 or something like that. So I'm just wondering like, how can we work that into the schedule and do all that good stuff? Well, we can change the time. So we could try to change the time or I can meet twice, right? I can meet with two different sections of students. Because you can't just not come, right. right? And that's only three days of class. And so I wouldn't mind meeting two separate classes. Um, so let's talk about that. It's you and Titus. Is there anybody else? Uh, Jason and I think October too. Yeah, okay. Well, if there's four of you, it's certainly worth. Yeah, I can meet a half hour and a half twice. Probably if there's so few students, it'd just be an hour class because everybody will get a chance to talk. And I'll have two separate one hour classes. As soon as I get like enough information on uh, like what time we can schedule and talk to you, I'll definitely hit you as, as soon as I can. 
The only downside is I think actually like hearing what each other say. So actually, I think we could meet later in the day. Ugh. Um, yeah, I think we could meet a little bit later. So how much, how late does football go? The football stuff. Uh, uh, so we have dinner at 6.30. Um, you, the rest of you can go if you want. Well, I guess you could stay and see. Dinner at 6.30 and then what? Uh, at 7.30, uh, from 7.45, we have the team meeting. And at 7.45 to 9.15, we have uh, position meetings. And then 9.15 to 9.30, we have staff meeting. And then 10.30, we're done. At night. Um, 10.30 at night? Yeah, OK. Um, um, lights, it lights out, something like that. Jason. I don't know what lights out is at 10:30. Yes, man. Uh, no, nah, it'll it'll be um those four days will be all um will pretty much be football all day, but I think uh I think uh coach is, he he might let us go for like regular class time, and so we'll, he, we might be able to just attend the regular class time. I I have to believe that that. You know, there's going to be something coming from the president and the provost saying the football players can't skip the last week of class. No, no, we won't. Um, no, he, coach won't let us skip class at all. Um, but uh, yeah, it, especially if it's three work, weeks worth of classes. So, yes, ma'am. Um, I mean, we might be able. What do you have before six thirty? Football. Uh, at 5 to 6 p.m., we have academic boot camp install, and at 6.30, we have dinner. Well, how about if your academic boot camp is going to class? <laughs> uh, uh, anyway, you've got to so, – somebody has got to work that out because there's no way, Jose, that every summer school teacher is going to say, oh, yeah, football players, they can miss the last three weeks of class, Right. Um, so something's got to give. Yeah. And, okay. um, uh, I would run a class at midnight, but if you got to have lights out, then I can't even do that. No, uh, Dr. Beck. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm pretty sure, um, we're, we probably will be able to attend class at the, at the regular time, but, um, like Trey said, once we find out more, we'll, we'll let you know as soon as possible. Um, knowing Coach Douglas, um, there's no doubt in my mind we're not going to be missing class, but we'll probably um, – that um, – Why don't you just – why don't you just tell him that he needs to contact me or we need to get a note from the provost, right? We need to get something soon. Got you. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, we got you. Thanks. Thanks for letting me know. And Titus actually had some questions he sent in an email. Wonderful Titus, very conscientious. So we'll have to get to that too. All right. We'll see you. Bye-bye.